Hello students, it's Dr. Lyons, of course, who else would this be? Uh, and in this chapter, we're going to talk about some basic chemistry. Uh, so kind of the next next few chapters, we're going to kind of build on top of each other. Right. So in this chapter, we're going to talk about some very simple chemistry. And then in the next chapter, we'll talk about how we might put together some different chemical compounds to form things that are inside of us. Uh, and then we'll talk about how we put some of those things together to make the inner workings of our cells. So we're kind of building here from like one level to another to another. Uh, so, but first we'll start with, with some basic chemistry. Uh, and I don't have any pictures of chemical compounds because of course those are very hard to take on account of them being so small. But here's a picture of a clownfish that I took. So we're gonna start uh, really simple. Uh, so we'll talk really quickly about maybe some things you learned about in high school. For instance, what is matter? Right? Matter is, of course, just anything that has mass. It's basically any physical thing in the universe. So air is matter, water is matter, you are matter, I'm matter, your computer is matter. All those things that take up physical space in the, uh, in the universe are matter. Uh, the three states of matter, you probably know these. So water, liquids, and gases. Uh, you know, in, in your room right now, there's probably water in two different states, right? So there's, there's, there's water vapor in the air around you, and there's liquid water inside of you. And if you have a glass of ice water, then you have some solid water in there as well. What is mass? So mass is essentially a, uh, it is the, pro the property of all matter that makes matter attracted to other matter. Right, so all physical things in the universe are attracted to each other, uh, and this is related to you know the gravitational field that that exists around all objects, uh, and so mass is basically that. It's it's the it's the physical pulling uh, of two objects towards each other uh, because of the matter that is in them. So essentially, the more matter that is in something, the more mass it would have, and the more it would pull it uh, on other objects. So the Earth, of course, has a huge amount of mass, which is why we are we are all stuck to it. Uh, but your computer, you know, doesn't have a huge amount of mass, so you're not really stuck to your computer. Okay, and do living organisms contain matter? The answer is definitely yes, uh, which is why we're talking about it here. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about the things that make up matter. Uh, so first we'll talk about elements, right? So these are, these are things that can't be broken down into other substances, right? So for instance, uh, something like, uh, something like oxygen, right? That is an element, right? So if you have one oxygen, you cannot break it down into other things. You can't break oxygen down into something like helium or, or hydrogen, right? So an element is something that you can't break it down into other things. Uh, and elements make up the base of all matter, right? So all matter is made up by individual elements or different types of elements that are all combined uh, to each other. So of course, there is this table that you've probably heard of, of the, the periodic table of elements. Uh, there are 92 elements that occur naturally and then some others that have been synthesized uh, in labs. Uh, this here, this picture is one of my favorite uh, periodic tables of elements. Uh, this is the one that is at the Griffith Observatory. And inside each of these boxes, they actually have uh, uh, one of that element there for you to look at. Uh, well, in the case of something like hydrogen, which is a gas at room temperature, it's just an empty box. But either way, things that are solid, like, like gold, uh, it has a little piece of gold in there so you can see what the different elements look like. Right, so the, the elements that you probably know of are things like helium, things like gold, like hydrogen, like oxygen, carbon, right? All of those things are different types of elements. Uh, and there's a, there's a close-up picture of kind of what I was telling you about. So, for instance, uh, if you ever want to know what scandium looks like, that's what it looks like. And if you want to see it in person, you'll just have to go to the, to the Griffith Observatory. So here's another look at a periodic table of elements, but with a little bit more information, right? So all the letters refer to all the abbreviations of the different elements, right? So like here, we're looking at C, for instance, that is carbon, right? That is a, a crucially important element to all of us living things. 
Uh, the atomic number, uh, that uh, tells us the number of protons, which we'll, we'll get to in a minute. Uh, and the atomic mass, that is the, the average weight that, uh, that that particular element would have. Uh, it's an average because not all carbons are the same. Sometimes they have slightly different numbers of things inside of them, uh, which is why this is an average and not a, uh, and not a standard uh, mass that one carbon weighs. But for the most part, most carbons weigh uh, somewhere around 12.01 uh, of, uh, of that atomic mass unit. So there are just four elements that make up a huge fraction of our weight, uh, that make up 96% of them. So think about that for a minute. Which uh, elements do you think might make up the biggest amount of us? So a minute ago, I talked about how carbon is really important. So that, in fact, is one of the four. Uh, in, a, in another point, I think in the last chapter, I talked really briefly about how we are very watery inside, right? And so think about uh, what elements go into water. So the two elements that do that are oxygen and are hydrogen. So those both make up a huge amount of our weight. Uh, and then finally, we have a large amount of nitrogen that is inside of us. So oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen make up a huge amount of our weight. Uh, and then the roughly other 4% are, are more kind of what are known as trace elements inside of us. Uh, if you were to make a pie chart out of a human uh, based on the elements, this is what it would look like, right? So most of us is oxygen followed by carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Uh, and then there's uh, these, these lesser elements, including things like calcium, uh, I think probably most of you are thinking, okay, that's probably what is in my bones. Uh, you're right about that. Uh, and then there are trace elements of which there's very, very small amounts like iron. You know, there's some of that in our blood, for instance, uh, boron, chromium, copper. So we have all these, all these things inside of us, but in very, very small amounts. So, you know, please don't memorize this whole big list of things. That's kind of silly. Uh, but I do want you to know what the four elements are that make up the bulk of our weight. Okay, so when we put together elements, uh, they form what are known as compounds, right? So uh, as we talked about, elements can't be broken down into other substances, but compounds can because compounds are when you have multiple elements that are bound uh, to each other. So some examples. Uh, it includes NaCl, which is uh, sodium chloride, otherwise known as table salt. Right? So this is what you use to put on your, on your food. Uh, it's the same salt that you would find in the ocean. Uh, it's the same salt that you would find in your blood, uh, actually. So internally, we are about as salty as the ocean is, believe it or not. Maybe some of us are saltier than others, uh, but we are all pretty salty inside. Uh, and we have this same thing, this sodium chloride. Uh, H2O, you know, water, so two hydrogens and one oxygen, that's the uh, And so let's look, talk a little bit now about the different types of parts that go into elements. So elements uh, each consist of one type of atom. Uh, and so an atom is, is that actual very, very tiny thing uh, that makes up elements. Uh, and atoms come in different types of shapes and sizes. Right? And they have different numbers of what are known as protons, electrons, and neutrons. Uh, and so the protons are what give an atom a positive charge. An electron gives an atom a negative charge, and a neutron gives it no charge. So you can kind of think of it as like a little battery that has like a positive part and a, and a negative part. Uh, and so each atom will have a different number of these things inside of it. Uh, but if an atom has, say, six protons, that atom is of the element carbon. If an atom has eight protons, it is of the element oxygen, right? So each element consists of one type of atom that has a specific number of protons. So if you have six, you're carbon. If you have eight, you're oxygen. Uh, that's how it works. If you have just one, you're hydrogen. If you have two, you're helium. Uh, so elements are made of atoms that have one particular number of protons. So here is a cartoonized uh, picture of an of a atom. Right? So this atom has uh, uh, protons and neutrons in its nucleus, as do all 
atoms. Uh, the way that I kind of think about this is, is kind of like the sun, and then you have these electrons are kind of like the planets that are kind of whizzing around uh, the sun, kind of orbiting the sun. Right, so all atoms have a nucleus with protons and neutrons in them, and they all have electrons that are kind of moving uh, around the, the, the outside of the, of the nucleus, kind of like how planets orbit the, the sun. So let's talk a little bit more about how atoms are structured. Uh, and now we're going to kind of come back to our periodic table of, of elements. So as I said before, uh, the number of protons is, is unique for each element. So like I was saying before, if an atom has six uh, protons, it is carbon, which is why the atomic number for carbon is six. Uh, and I was saying before that if an atom has eight protons, that means it's oxygen, which is why the atomic number for oxygen is eight. So the, the numbers that you see in the top of each of those boxes refers to the number of protons, uh, which is going to tell us some important things about how that atom behaves uh, and how that atom behaves towards other types of atoms. So for instance, helium, we see there, helium is abbreviated HE, uh, and it has the, the atomic number two, so it has two protons inside of it. Uh, and that's actually what you saw in that, that figure in the last slide. Right? So I showed a figure where there was uh, an atom with two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. Uh, so that would have been helium. Okay, so let's talk a little bit now about how atoms bond to each other to form compounds, or otherwise known as molecules. So the, the really key thing to, to look at are the electrons. So in, in an atom's typical resting state, uh, or stable state, uh, it has, maybe that's not the right way to describe it, but uh, an atom's typical number of electrons is the same as its protons, right? So for instance, helium typically has two protons, and so it will have, or helium always has two protons, so it will typically have two electrons. Uh, Ne, this is neon. This is what makes, you know, bright neon signs. Uh, neon typically has 10 uh, or, or always has 10 protons and typically has 10 electrons. So uh, as a starting point, uh, the number of protons is always going to equal the number of electrons. Uh, and uh, electrons, they occur in what are known as shells, uh, what are specifically known as valence shells. Uh, and so you can think of these as like orbits, as paths that electrons take when they are moving around uh, the, the, the inside, the, the nucleus. Kind of in the same way that all of the different planets have different orbits that they take as they are moving around the sun. Uh, however, unlike the planets, so planets have just one planet per orbit, uh, in the case of electrons, there could be multiple electrons in the same orbit that is going around the, the nucleus. Uh, and the number of electrons that can go into each one of those orbits increases the further you get from the nucleus. So in the very first shell of, of electrons that are outside of the nucleus, uh, there can only be two in that area. So the max number would be two there. In the second shell around the, the nucleus, so the second shell of electrons, there can be a total of eight uh, in that particular shell. Uh, if we go one more, uh, if we go to a third shell, that can have eight electrons in it. Uh, and as you keep going, the number gets higher and higher. So we go up to 16, then 32, then 64, and it keeps going uh, up and up and up beyond that. Uh, and so the number of electrons in these shells is really what's key uh, in terms of figuring out how they will bond to other electrons. Uh, because atoms want to have well, it's not that they want anything because they're not, you know, they're not thinking uh, cognitive things. Uh, but what is stable for them is to have all of the electron shells completely filled. So uh, if an atom has just one, uh, just has one shell, it wants to have two electrons in the shell. That, that's what makes it stable. So helium naturally has two electrons in that shell, which is why helium is a very, very uh, stable gas. Uh, 
you know, which is why we will fill, you know, balloons with helium and take them to parties. You wouldn't take a flammable gas and put that in a balloon and take it to a party. Uh, at least I hope you wouldn't. You know, that wouldn't be a very, very good idea. Uh, but that is what would happen if you took hydrogen gas, for instance. So hydrogen has just one shell, uh, but it only has one electron in that shell. So it really wants to get a, a second uh, electron uh, to, to attach uh, to, that, to that shell to make it stable, which is why hydrogen is reactive. So it will bond to other things, uh, and which is why hydrogen is quite flammable. Uh, so that's why you, it wouldn't be a very good idea to take a hydrogen balloon to a birthday party. Uh, so the next time you're going to a birthday party, you know, fill your balloons with helium, not with hydrogen. Uh, so let's now talk a little bit about, uh, talk a little bit about where we put those electrons. So if we know that electro that an uh, atom has, say, 11 electrons, what we're always going to do is to, to figure out where those electrons go is start on the inside and work our way outward. So we would put two electrons in the first shell, then we would put eight electrons in the second shell, and we would put just one electron in the third shell uh, because we work our way from the inside out. So we start with two and then we would put eight uh, and then we would have just one left if we had 11 electrons. So just one electron would go in that next shell. Okay, so I want you to get some, some practice uh, uh, doing this. Uh, I want to see if you can figure out, you know, where, you know, where the electrons are, go, are gonna go. So first, as an as a example, we'll start, we'll start with fluorine, which is, which is F. So what I'll do is first I'm gonna draw in the, the nucleus right there, okay? Uh, and so I'm telling you that fluorine has nine protons which means is in its standard state, it's gonna have nine electrons. So we draw one shell uh, and we're gonna put two electrons there. So I'll draw the electrons as X's. So one there and one there. And where exactly you put the electrons doesn't matter. You can put them both on the top, on the side, wherever, it doesn't matter. So we have two electrons that we've now accounted for, that we have homes for. Uh, so, but we know that we have nine total to deal with, so we need to have another shell. So we add one more shell here, uh, and we have seven electrons to, to account for. Uh, and this shell uh, can handle eight, meaning that this shell can, can accommodate all of those other seven electrons. So we draw them in. So we have two electrons there, we'll put in, we'll put in two over there, uh, we'll put in one there. Put there and there, and then finally one more that's right there, okay? So we've got two electrons in the first shell and seven electrons in the second shell. So, so the number of electrons we see here is nine. The number of electrons is two, right? So we see one here and then two right there. Uh, number of electrons in the outermost shell is seven, right? If we count them up, up if we count up those electrons, uh, going around, we so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, and then seven. Okay, uh, and then the number of electrons that it needs to be complete is just one, because uh, essentially what we what we have here uh, is is in this space. Oops, sorry, my computer for us there for a second. Uh, in this space right here, we have uh, an, a vacancy, right? There could be one electron there, but there isn't one right there. Uh, so essentially we could accommodate one more. So this uh, atom wants one more electron in that particular place, okay? So what I want you to do now is I want you to, in your notes, see if you can work through sulfur and see if you can work through boron. See if you can figure out, uh, you know, how many electron shells they're going to have, how many electrons are going to be in their outermost shell, uh, and then how many more electrons they need uh, in order to fill up their outermost shell. So I want you to go ahead and pause the video, uh, work through those, and then unpause it, and, and we'll work through uh, these two other, other atoms. Okay, so I'm assuming that you that you at least tried your best to work through these. 
Uh, let's let's do boron uh, next. So we've got boron is B. So we'll draw in uh, the the center part there. So that's where its neutrons and protons are. Uh, and then we'll start with that first shell. Uh, and by now, I think you all know that there would be two electrons in that first shell because we can put two in the first, eight in the second, eight in the third. So we got two electrons there, uh, but we know that boron will have five electrons total, meaning that we have three more electrons to account for. So we go to a second shell like that, and we added one, two, and then finally three. So we have, uh, so we have, let's see where are we going. So we have two uh, electron shells, and we are two, yep, two electron shells, and we have three electrons uh, in that outermost shell. Uh, and so you probably remember that we can accommodate uh, a total of seven, sorry, a total of eight electrons in that outermost shell, uh, meaning that we have rooms for, now for. Uh, five more electrons because we have three in that outermost shell we can take eight total uh, meaning that there are five more electrons that it needs so boron wants to get five more electrons in order to be complete okay finally let's talk about sulfur right so sulfur has 16 uh, uh, electrons total so we'll write that in there so we have the first shell and that has one uh, two electrons. Then we have the second shell, right? And so you know by now that's going to have eight electrons in it. Uh, but we still have six more electrons to deal with because we have two in the first shell and eight in the second. Uh, so we need to open up a third shell. Uh, and we're going to add six electrons there. So one, two, three, four, and then five and six. So the number of electron shells we have here is three. The number that we have in the outermost shell is six. Uh, so that means that we have two electrons that the that the atom wants, right? In order to to be complete, uh, we would need to add. Uh, two more electrons there. We would need to add an electron right there and one right there, uh, and then it would be complete. So, so sulfur would want to grab two more electrons, which is why sulfur will bond to other things. In fact, all three of these atoms will bond to other things in order to fill up their outermost shells. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, about a little more about chemical bonding. Uh, now that you kind of uh, understand how atoms are built, now you can kind of start to uh, learn about how atoms react to each other. So there are three different types of chemical bonds that we're going to talk about here. Uh, in the first type of, of chemical bond we'll talk about are ionic bonds. So these are or when uh, atoms gain or lose electrons, uh, they essentially transfer electrons to each other. So when an atom loses an electron, it becomes what's known as an ion. If an atom gains an electron, it also becomes an ion. So ions are electrically charged. Uh, and so let's, let's talk about why it is that they become electrically charged. So if an atom starts out having six protons and six, new, uh, uh, six electrons, then its charge is equal because we have six positive charges and six negative charges. If you remove one of those negative charges, now it's going to have one more positive charge than it does negative charges. And now that atom is going to have a charge to it. The same thing would happen if you were to add an electron to that atom. Now it will have more electrons than, than protons. So it would have a slightly negative charge. So if we, if we add or subtract electrons from an atom, it's going to become an ion. It's going to have a, a charge. Uh, and so that's what happens with ionic bonds. Uh, one atom gives an electron to the other. And so those two atoms, because one has lost an electron and one has gained an electron, they now both have charges. So ionic bonds occur between those oppositely charged ions uh, because opposites attract. Uh, 
right? So, so think about a magnet, for instance. Uh, the positive end of one magnet will only stick to the negative end of another magnet. So if two electrons share, uh, if two atoms share electrons, uh, or, or two, um, say one atom gives an electron to another atom, now they, those two atoms have opposite charges and are going to be attracted to each other. Uh, and so a good example of this is table salt. So let's talk a little bit about how, about how table salt uh, works. Uh, so what you see here is on the left, we have sodium, a sodium atom and we have a chlorine atom here on the right. Uh, and so sodium uh, is built such that it has just one electron in its outermost shell. So for sodium, it's a lot easier for it to just get rid of that electron. Uh, if it gets rid of that electron, then it just has two shells and both of those shells are complete. Chlorine has the opposite problem. So chlorine is, is missing one electron from its outermost shell. It just really needs to get one more electron in order for it to be complete. So these two atoms are a match made in heaven, right? One, one is looking to get rid of an electron and one needs just one electron. So what they do is the sodium gives its electron to the chlorine. Uh, not you know, necessarily out of the goodness of its heart, but just because it wants to be stable. But so when sodium gives that electron to the chlorine, now that sodium has a slightly positive charge because it's lost it, one of its negative charges. And chlorine becomes negative because it's now gained a negative charge. And so because we have a positively charged ion and a negatively charged ion right next to each other because they just transferred uh, electrons between them, now we have this, this compound. Now we have table salt. So every, you know, Every atom, or I'm sorry, every molecule of table salt that you've ever consumed in your life and all the salt inside of you right now, this is how that forms, uh, is by one atom transferring an electron to another atom. Okay, so covalent bonds are another type that, uh, that work a little bit differently. Right, so with covalent bonds, uh, it's all about sharing. Uh, so with those ionic bonds, we talked about one atom giving an electron to another atom. With covalent bonds, it's not necessarily that one atom is giving an, an electron to another one. It's that they're actually sharing the, the electrons between them. Uh, it's as if you were to take two children uh, and each of those children brought their toys uh, out to a park uh, and they shared all of their toys together. Right. So with covalent bonds, sharing is caring. So this is when two atoms are, are sharing pairs of electrons. So a good example of this is hydrogen gas, right? So in the case of, of hydrogen, uh, hydrogen has just one proton and one electron. So what two hydrogen atoms can do is they can bond with each other. Uh, and so then each of those hydrogen atoms have access to two different uh, electrons. Uh, because hydrogen atom one will allow hydrogen atom two to use its electron. Uh, and hydrogen atom two will allow hydrogen atom one to use its electrons. You know, it's, it's like the example I gave of two kids playing with their toys in a park. You know, kid number one brings a toy and kid number two brings a toy. Uh, and the two kids together play with both of the toys. That's kind of what goes on with covalent bonds. So hydrogen bonds are when, uh, or when we take a covalent bond, but there's something kind of, there's kind of an additional wrinkle going on with them. So hydrogen bonds uh, involve hydrogens, as you can kind of guess. Uh, and a really good example of this happening is with water. So water comes from a covalent bond between one oxygen atom uh, and two hydrogen atoms, right? So we have the oxygen here in the middle and the hydrogens on the side. Uh, and so oxygen starts uh, with a total of uh, eight electrons. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So oxygen will share one of its electrons with a hydrogen and another one of its electrons with a different hydrogen. In the hydrogen, it has one electron. It shares that with oxygen. And this other hydrogen shares its one electron with oxygen. So in total, the hydrogen's complete, right? Because this hydrogen has two electrons around its first shell, so it's complete and stable. And this hydrogen over here 
it is complete because it has two electrons around its outermost shell. And the same with the oxygen. The oxygen needs to have eight electrons around its second shell, and you can count them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so that's a, a typical covalent bond. Uh, but where this gets a little more tricky uh, is, is in that uh, oxygen really holds on to those electrons a little more than do the hydrogen atoms. So let's return again to the example of the two kids, you know, playing with, sharing with and playing with their toys in, in the park. Uh, if one of those kids is vastly bigger than the other kid, you know, which kid gets to spend more time playing with those two toys? You know, obviously it's the bigger kid. Uh, maybe some of you have experience with this if you have siblings. Uh, I personally had, a, I had have three younger brothers. So when we were kids, I think I probably had the, was, was the older, meaner brother that, that had more time with the toys, you know, until they, all three of my younger brothers got bigger than me and then the, then the tables were turned. So that's what's going on here. So oxygen is like the older, bigger sibling and the hydrogens are like the smaller, younger siblings. Uh, and so what we have is electrons spending more time around the oxygen and less time around the hydrogens. Uh, and so what happens here is this property makes water polar. So there's an uneven distribution of charge going on here. So because the electrons are spending more time by the oxygen, uh, we have a negative charge around the oxygen atoms. Uh, whereas because the electrons are spending less time around the hydrogens, we have positive charges around the hydrogen atoms. So water molecules, each water molecule is kind of like a little magnet uh, because it has a negative end and a positive end, just like a magnet, which is why water molecules will stick to itself. Right, so this is what a hydrogen bond is. Right, so the positive end of one water molecule will stick to the negative end of another water molecule. Because as we talked about before with ionic bonds, opposites attract. So a negative charge will be attracted to a positive charge. So the negative end of one water molecule will stick to the positive end of another water molecule. Uh, in that incredibly simple thing of water molecules sticking to, the, to themselves, uh, is essentially why life can exist on this planet, right? It seems like such a simple, such a minute detail of life, but it's actually crucially important to, to life. Uh, and so we're gonna talk a little bit more about how this very simple property of water makes it so that it can support life on our planet. So as I was saying before, water is crucial to life. Right? We are made up of a huge amount of water. There's water inside of ourselves, there's water around ourselves. Right? So, so water is really key in polarity of water. So the fact that water molecules are like little magnets is why it is so crucial. So the first uh, property of water I wanted to talk about that is really important is cohesion. Right? So water molecules will stick to each other like I was talking about. Uh, and this is really important because that's how plants drink water, right? Because plants get their water from the ground uh, and, if, and, and they essentially drink through these long straws uh, up through their, their trunks and out through their stems into their leaves. They drink through these long straws. Uh, and if water didn't stick to itself, plants wouldn't be able to suck water up through their straws. If water didn't stick to itself, you wouldn't be able to just drink water through a straw. It wouldn't actually be possible. So the cohesion of water is really, really important because we are hugely reliant on plants, right? If you just look outside, you're going to see a crap ton of plants, uh, which illustrates just how important they are. So cohesion, like I was saying, is what molecules sticking together uh, and specifically molecules of the same kind sticking to each other. Uh, adhesion is another property of water. That means water sticking to other surfaces, like, like the water in your, in your glass uh, is sticking to the sides of, of the glass. Uh, cohesion of water uh, is also what, partly why belly flops hurt so much, because when you hit the water in a belly flop pose, uh, you, 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 you're essentially going to have to break up a lot of those hydrogen bonds, which requires energy, which means that there's a lot of force pushing back against you. So that's part of why belly flops aren't so pleasant. 
Uh, and this I know from experience because I, I was a, a springboard diver when I was in college. Not a very good one, which means that I did a lot of belly flopping. Okay, another property of water, uh, or another important thing about water that relates to its polarity is that water is really good at moderating temperature. So water absorbs a lot of heat when it's warming and gives off a lot of heat when it's cooling. The reason why is because as you heat up water, uh, you need to disrupt the hydrogen bonds. You need to break up those hydrogen bonds. Uh, and when water is cooling, uh, it, is, uh, it is giving off a lot of heat because, uh, because there's a lot of energy stored in it in the form of those hydrogen bonds. So the hydrogen bonds breaking and forming is, is why it is that water you know, can absorb a lot of heat. Uh, and I think you, you probably know this if you've you know, ever put a pot of water on a, uh, on a stove to, to boil it to make you know, rice or pasta or whatever. Uh, you know that that water takes a long time to get up to boil. Uh, so water absorbs a huge amount of heat in order for it to uh, increase its temperature. Uh, and water will you know, conversely give off a lot of heat as it's cooling down. So of course the earth has a huge supply of water, you know, it's called our oceans. Uh, it, this covers roughly 70% of, of our planet. Uh, and so all of those oceans act as a moderator of temperature, right? So if in an area, if it gets too warm, the, the ocean will absorb a lot of that heat. And if it gets too cold in an area, uh, the, the ocean will, will absorb a lot of, uh, sorry, if it gets too cold in an area, the ocean will give off a lot of heat into that area. So the, the water acts like kind of like a little thermostat that, uh, that moderates the temperature on our planet and keeps it, you know, within reasonable bounds that, that, that don't fluctuate wildly. So other, other planets that, that don't have water on them, they see much wider fluctuations in temperature between night and day. So like on the moon, for instance, there are these massive swings in temperature between night and day. And a lot of that is, is because, uh, because there's no water uh, or there's, there's no actual liquid water on the surface of the, of the moon. Right, so like I was saying, this giant supply of water moderates our temperature. Okay, ice floating may, may seem like a not that important thing. You know, we might just think, well, I guess that's kind of nice that we have, can have ice in our, you know, in our gin and tonics or whatever. Uh, but ice floating is actually a really important property uh, of water for, for life on our planet. Uh, and so the reason why ice floats is kind of interesting. So when you cool down water molecules, what's happening is those water molecules are slowing down more and more and more, right? So with any, uh, any matter in the universe, when you cool it down, the molecules that make it up are, are slowing down. You know, because uh, in, in anything, the, the molecules and atoms that make up matter are kind of vibrating around. And so when you cool down water, the, those water molecules are slowing down uh, and what eventually happens uh, is that they become stable. They become kind of stopped in, in place. Uh, and when they do, the hydrogen bonds uh, become permanent. Uh, when water is in its liquid state, uh, the molecules are, are constantly forming and unforming uh, bonds, those hydrogen bonds. But when you freeze water, those hydrogen bonds become permanent. And what they do is they hold the water molecules apart in a sort of ice matrix. Uh, you know, think of like a snowflake and how it has this sort of six-sided uh, uh, matrix kind of dimensionality to it. Uh, the same thing is happening with ice as you, as you freeze it. So water molecules get held further apart when they, when they freeze, which makes them expand. Uh, and maybe you've experienced this. So perhaps at some point you put, say, a can of soda in the freezer uh, to cool it down. And then you forgot about it and you said, ah, oh, crap. And you went back to it and found that that can of soda had exploded. The reason is because those hydrogen bonds became permanent, holding the water molecules apart and increasing the volume. Uh, so the volume increases, the size of the can, the aluminum doesn't increase, and so it explodes. Uh, and so because water, water expands when it freezes, uh, it becomes less dense. Uh, and so less dense things will float on top of more dense things. So that's actually a very strange property of water. There's, there's really not many other things that when you freeze them, they are 
less dense than when they are in a liquid uh, state. So most things, you know, when you make them solid, they would they would sink into the liquid form of themselves. You know, if you were to take uh, molten steel and drop a piece of solid steel into it, the steel, the solid steel will, would sink down to the bottom, uh, but not the case with water. And so I already answered this. So is ice more or less dense than water? Ice is less dense than water, which is why it floats. So what happens uh, when water freezes then is that it floats on the top and the ice axe is a little blanket uh, that keeps the water underneath it from getting so cold that it will freeze. So what that means is that oceans and lakes and ponds and stuff, they freeze on the top, but they don't freeze all the way down to the bottom. So all of the things that are living below that can still survive, which is really important to all that, those living things. Uh, it's also important because we don't want to live on a planet that looks like this. You know, because this is a, a terrible planet to live in with all these big mechanical things walking around shooting you and everything is is cold. You know, it's 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 terrible. Uh, and if water didn't freeze and float on the top, uh, then it's possible that whole oceans could actually freeze from top to bottom, uh, which would make life on this planet very, very difficult indeed. OK, one last property of water I want to talk about. Uh, that's related to its polarity and that is crucially important uh, is the fact that water will act as a solvent really, really well. So first of all, some terminology. So solutions are liquids that have two or more substances in them. And inside of a solution, we have the solvent, which is doing the dissolving. And we have the solute, which is the thing that dissolves the, the other, that gets dissolved into the solvent. So you can think of the solvent as the bigger part and the solute as the smaller part. So for instance, if you were to take you know, some ocean water, the water would be the solvent and the salt would be the solute. Uh, and so water is a great solvent for substances that have electrical charges. Uh, the reason why is that if something has a positive charge, the negative end of a water molecule will stick to it. If something has a negative charge, then the positive end of a water molecule will, would stick to it. So salt, for instance, will dissolve into water because salt is made up of positively charged sodium ions, which will stick to water, and negatively charged chloride ions, which will stick to water. So if it wasn't for this property of water, then the oceans wouldn't be salty because all that salt that is in the ocean that's dissolved into it would just sink down to the bottom of the ocean and all the oceans would be fresh, just like like lakes and ponds and rivers and such. Uh, this would be really challenging for us because we need salt inside of us. We need salt dissolved in our blood and in our fluids, right? Like I was saying before, we are very, very salty inside. Uh, and why we need to be so salty inside is because we use those salts for a lot of different things. For instance, your nervous system uses salts uh, in order for the individual cells in your nervous system to communicate with each other. Uh, if you didn't have salts inside of your, your body, dissolved into your body, then your nervous system wouldn't work. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I personally like having my brain and the rest of my nervous system uh, working. So this property of water is really quite, quite important, right? We wouldn't be able to exist uh, without water acting as a solvent. And so here's just a picture showing what I, what I just described, right? So sodium ions have a positive charge, so the negative ends of water molecules will stick to them. Uh, and chloride ions have a negative charge, so the positive end of water molecules will stick to them. So if you were to take a glass of water and pour a bunch of salt in it, that salt would eventually all dissolve into the water. You know, unless, of course, you put just, you know, tons and tons and tons of salt in it, then the, water, then the solution would become, you know, hyper salty. But some amount of salt is going to dissolve into the water because these uh, water molecules will grab onto the sodium and the chloride and, li chloride and lift them out of the, the bottom. Okay, so that's all I've got to tell you about basic general chemistry. Uh, in the next chapter, we'll talk about some of the organic compounds that, that make up us.